Um, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so again, my name is Jens Kuhn. And uh, before I get started talking a little bit about uh, teaching careers at the community college, uh, just a little bit of, of additional background. So even though I'm the dean right now for uh, math, sciences, uh, school of modern languages, and English as a second language at uh, Santa Barbara City College, uh, prior to that, I was faculty in uh, the chemistry department. So I've got a chemistry background. and. Um, was teaching at Santa Barbara City College for about a dozen years or so, um, and department chair in chemistry for about six years. Um, so that's what my background in, in terms of teaching at the community college is. And so what I'd like to do this morning is give you a little bit of sort of a nuts and bolt kind of uh, idea, overview of what some of the things are that might be important if this is something that you potentially are interested in exploring. Um, I realize that some of this, or depending on what your background is and where you're coming from, maybe a lot of this might not be rocket science or it might be stuff that you're already familiar with, but I do hope that you know maybe some of these things are, are sort of news or I can maybe shed some light on, on some questions that you might have. Uh, that being said, we, we've got, I think, 30 minutes allocated for this. I'm not going to go for the entire 30 minutes, so you'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. And then also feel free to interrupt me if you know, somewhere along the way um, I'm not making any sense or you've got additional questions or whatnot. So depending on how long those are, we can certainly accommodate those or otherwise maybe we can chat afterwards. But, but anyway, so my point is feel free to interrupt me. So. Um, what I want to do, again, is, is give you sort of a couple of overview kind of pointers. And so the first question is, well, what kind of teaching careers are there at community college? This first part is certainly not going to be uh, anything that's, uh, uh, that's not obvious, right? So there are short-term and there are long-term positions. But what I want to point out is that um, some of these, if you're potentially interested in some of these longer-term teaching opportunities, these short-term um, opportunities might really be something to explore and sort of use as, as a way of getting your foot in the door. Um, so when you're looking for these kinds of positions, of course, short-term positions, they are typically identified as part-time or adjunct. They're, those are used interchangeably. Different community colleges use different terms for that. But that's essentially what you're looking at. But there's something else that's maybe not as obvious. And these are what's typically referred to as temporary contracts. So temporary contracts are what at a UC you might be referring to as a visiting uh, position or something like that. So these are oftentimes a year long. They can be only a semester long. Um, so what's the difference here? Well, the difference here is that they're still short term because they've got a, you know, it's a limited term contract, right? But um, they are a different kind of an opportunity because they're typically full time. Um, and if they're a year long, they potentially come with benefits. It depends a little bit on the uh, place that you're at, but that's a different kind of opportunity that, you know, in some cases is rare. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of those, but it is, again, something that might be worthwhile if this is something that you're potentially interested in. And then, of course, the long-term positions are full-time tenure-track positions at, you know, in, in, at uh, community colleges, right? So now there's a couple of other things. And so uh, I've got a, a sort of a short list of other stuff here. I'm not going to be talking much about that. But the reason why I have that up here is so program coordinator positions, faculty mentors, student clubs, projects, outreach opportunities. So why is this up there? Well, because these might be opportunities to sort of get your foot in the door. Right, so to uh, explore is a teaching position at a community college really something that I'm actually interested in or really something that's going to work for me. And these aren't really teaching opportunities, but they're opportunities that allow you to work with the student population at a community college to see the environment, to figure out, you know, is this something that I might want to look into further. Um, and that being said, like I said, you know, a lot of this isn't, <laughs> isn't all that difficult to figure out. So one of the questions that comes up with this is, well, how in the world is any of this really different from you know, something I might be looking at in terms of a teaching opportunity at a UC or at a four-year institution or a private institution or what have you? It turns out it's actually very, very, very different. And so why is it very different? The reason why it's very different is because the student population or the student demographics at a community college are very, very different from what you would see at a UC or at other types of institutions. And again, some of you may have started at a community college, so this is nothing new to you. But I want to illustrate that with a couple of data points here. So for instance, if you look at ethni ethnicity, these are uh, Santa Barbara City College numbers. These are slightly different in some cases from other community colleges, but the basic gist is the same. This is all fall two, uh, 2017 data. So this isn't really something, you know, the ethnicity is, is, is not really something that you're going to see large variations across. Uh, most community colleges in California are going to be Hispanic serving institutions, right? So SBCC has got about 40% uh, Hispanic student population, 43% white, Asian 7% uh, and African American 3%. Doesn't add up. A lot of these numbers aren't going to add up to 100% just because I left out, you know, smaller numbers, things like that. But, 
But anyway, so that may not be all that different, but there's a couple of other things that really illustrate this, how the student population is different. Uh, a couple of other pointers here in terms of gender distribution, 52% female, 46% male. Well, okay, how is that really different? Well, here's a real difference. Okay, about two-thirds of our students, almost two-thirds of our students are part-time students. And about a third of them are full-time students. I had a little bit more than that. Again, this, this is something that varies with community college to community college, but it's a similar kind of gist. So what does this mean? Okay, so there are, a lot of them are part-time students. What it means is that they've got a lot of other things going on. Uh, these are, some of them are part-time students because they choose to be part-time students. But a lot of them are part-time students because they have to be part-time students. Because they've got other things going on. They've got, you know, a family. They've, they might be returning students. They um, have a job. They have jobs, so on and so forth. Right? And this has implications for the classroom. So that's a huge difference right there. A couple of other things, if you look at age distribution, um, a little bit more than a third of our students are 19 or under, so typically uh, straight from high school, 20 to 24, about another third, 25 to 39, 20 percent, and then 40 or older, about another 10 percent. Right? So the age distribution that you're going to see at a community college is drastically different from what you're going to see at you know, a lot of other um, uh, institutions. And again, this is also something that doesn't vary all that widely between different community colleges. So you'll have a similar kind of distribution if you look at other, uh, at other places. And here's something that also illustrates this quite well. If you look at the type of student, um, so type of student meaning where are they coming from. So you can see this here in the different categories. About half of them are continuing students, so continuing on from semester to semester, which means that they're also, at some point, they were also in one of the other categories, right? But anyway, so they're continuing on. Uh, first time student, uh, almost 20%. Returning student, so returning student means that, you know, is, is somebody who's in the uh, older age category on the previous slide, right? So returning student, either maybe a military veteran or somebody who started a family, went back to school, you know, things like that. Um, and then first time transfer is somebody who comes from another community college. Uh, and then K through 12, those are uh, dual enrollment students, so those are high school students. Um, who are taking classes at a community college. So that's something where SBCC is a little bit unique. You're not going to see much of that. You're, you're not going to see that much of that at other uh, community colleges. So SBCC has a really robust uh, dual enrollment program, so that's a little bit unique. But there'll still be dual enrollment students at other, at other places. So now all of these students are not only in the institution, but they're also in the classroom and potentially in the same classroom. Right? So that varies greatly between semester to semester, what kind of class it is, time of day that it's offered, so on and so forth. There's great variations, right? You might have a class that's almost exclusively dual enrollment students, you might have a class that's almost exclusively returning students, things like that. It varies greatly, but the point is, chances are you're going to have a great, a huge variation, a huge diversity in any given classroom. And that's something that makes working in sort of a teaching environment at a community college very, very different from what you see at other place, it, uh, places, it also makes it very challenging in some ways, right? Reaching all those students who are coming in with a huge variety of backgrounds. Um, you know, these might be students who had their last math class last semester in high school, or they might be students who had their last math class 15 years ago in high school, right? So, and, and you have all these students potentially in the same classroom, so that makes it very challenging, but at the same time, it makes it very rewarding. Right? So if you ask community college instructors, a lot of them will say, well, you know, one of the things I really like about working there is working with that student population. Right? It's a very rewarding experience. It can be very challenging. But, um, and this is, of course, true for in the classroom as well as outside the classroom. Right? And so that's why I mentioned earlier some of these other you know, non-teaching related opportunities might really, be really, a really good way to get not only your foot in the door, but also to explore whether or not this might be something that you might uh, be interested in. So anyway, so these were a couple of data pieces just to illustrate that a little bit. So then the next question is, well, how in the world do you land a teaching job like this, right? So, um, and that depends a little bit in terms of what it is that you're specifically looking for, right? So first of all, there are um, what's known as minimum requirements. Those are state level minimum requirements. So every community college in the state of California has the same minimum requirement for being able to teach at a community college. And that's a master's degree in the discipline. Seems super straightforward, right? So you've got a master's, like my background is in chemistry. If I had a master's in chemistry, then I'd be eligible to teach in chemistry. That's a real straightforward sort of minimum requirement. Well, as you know, 
uh, a lot of places these days, and UCSB is a really good example, are very interdisciplinary, right? So if I had a master's in biochemistry, am I allowed to teach biology or chemistry? Uh, because most community colleges don't have a biochemistry department, right? So you can see it gets really tricky really quick. Um, and and uh, so if you have questions on that, I'd be happy to talk to you sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there are, you know, there are nuances to this that are beyond the, the scope of our 30 minutes here. But anyway, that's one of the minimum requirements. Because it can get tricky really quick, there's something else, and that's called an equivalency. So showing an equivalency to a master's degree in a particular discipline. Um, an easy way to show an equivalency is what I have up there, is if you're in a PhD program and you have advanced to candidacy, it's typically considered equivalent to having a master's degree in that discipline, even though you may not have the certificate that says you have a master's degree. Right? So that's sort of an easy, straightforward way to show an equivalency. Um, there are tons of nuances to equivalencies because of interdisciplinary degrees, and there are things like looking at you know, what courses specifically you have taken, so on and so forth. So that's also something that's beyond this. Uh, the time we have right now, but again, I'd be happy to chat with you about that. Just a couple of things that might be important. So the, the minimum requirement of having a master's degree in the discipline is a state level requirement. So if you've got a master's in that discipline that allows you to teach at every community college in the state of California. Equivalencies are local decisions. So if you have an equivalency to teach locally at Santa Barbara City College, you do not have an equivalency to teach locally at Ventura College or vice versa. You would have to go through that process at each place. That being said, for instance, there are um, single college, community college districts, Santa Barbara City College is one of them, and there are multiple college, community college districts. Ventura is another one. So Ventura College, Oxnard College, Moorpark College are one district, and so your equivalency would count for all three of those. Okay. Um, so those are, you know, those are some things about minimum requirements. There is something else that I don't have on here. I'll get to the teaching experience in a second. But if you're looking up applications, or not applications, but job uh, postings, you'll oftentimes see um, minimum qualifications listed, and then it'll say, or teaching credential. And that's probably not something that applies to most of you here. Teaching credentials were phased out in the 90s, so you can't get a teaching credential anymore. But if you have a teaching credential, um, from the late 80s or early 90s, those were lifetime teaching credentials, and so there are still applicants out there with those, and that's why you see that in job postings, right? So that's, just wanted to mention that in case you're wondering, what is that, how do I get it? If you don't have it, you can't get it anymore, okay? Um, and then the other, the other minimum requirement that's never really spelled out, uh, or sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's not, is teaching experience, okay? Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute here. That varies greatly. Uh, which is kind of obvious, I guess, between you looking for an adjunct or part-time position versus a full-time position, right? So there are, there are huge variations there. Um, the bottom line, I guess, that I might want to point out right now, it's a really, really tough sell to make a competitive, put a competitive application together for a full-time tenure track teaching position at a community college without, without having teaching experience at a community college, right? So, um, so then, these are some of the minimum requirements. So how do you find these jobs in the first place? Some of these things are going to be obvious again. Uh, but one of them that might not be that obvious is department chairs are a really good resource, right? So you have, you're in a position right here uh, where there's a community college just a couple miles down the road. If you're interested in this, a really good resource would be to contact a particular department chair at that community college, right? Or if you, maybe you live in Ventura or Oxnard, then those might be teaching opportunities for you, right? Because those are the ones who are going to be most knowledgeable, knowledgeable about their needs for uh, adjunct or part-time positions. Uh, those are not going to be your source for uh, full-time tenure track positions. I mean, you can ask them and they'll have an idea. but. But uh, uh, this is a really good resource that I would encourage you to take advantage of if you're looking for part-time positions. A couple of other places are job sites, of course. Um, and if you're looking at those, the, uh, uh, each community college is going to have a job site that's specific to their community college. So I just want to point out a couple of things here. So SBCCs, for instance, is jobs.sbcc.edu. You go there, you click on search jobs. And then um, you would find things like, so for instance, if I'm interested in, in biology, then I would actually have to look for biological sciences. Um, but but when he, uh, uh, whatever, my point is something else. And then what you'll see is, and I can't spell, um, there we go. And then what you'll see is, da, 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 
There we go. What you'll see is what's called an adjunct pool. Right, so you click on this, it'll have the job announcement, all the application material, stuff like that. But that's not my point. My point is that um, what you'll see oftentimes is what's called an adjunct pool. Um, and adjunct pools are uh, pools for <laughs> adjunct applications. So what, what does this mean? This means that these are sort of rolling pools that department chairs will pull from when there's a need. So adjunct or part-time positions are oftentimes not advertised right when there is a need because these are usually, maybe not usually, but oftentimes they're not figured out until you know, really late in the game. There's always, oftentimes, at least in the sciences, there's oftentimes a need period, um, but there's also a need that's not figured out until really late in the game, and then it's too late to do postings and this and that. So what happens often is that a department chair will go to their adjunct pool, will look all, at all those applications that are in there, and then invite people for, for an interview from there. So my point is, if you're potentially interested in something like this, put in an application into the adjunct pool and then follow up with the department chair. It's a really good way to get your name in there. It means potentially you might get a call back the week afterwards. Potentially you might not hear anything for a semester or a year, right, if there's no need. But this is the way to be in that pool when they're looking for a need because there's no time to do the posting you know, have it open for a couple of weeks, wait for applications, this and that, right? So that's where these adjunct pools come in. Um, the other site that I wanted to show you, uh-oh, now it all disappeared. Um, let's see here, there we go. Is this where I'm at? That's not where I'm at. Is this where I'm at? That's not where I'm at. Uh, did I just kill my presentation? I might have. Very cool. Uh, oh, here it is. That's not me. <laughs> Love it. I'll let you figure that out. Okay, okay so the other, <laughs> the other site that, uh, that I had up there was, it's called cccregistry.org. Um, the reason why I wanted to point that out is it's a, it's a California-wide um, registry for California community colleges that registers jobs. So their, their site is all about jobs at community colleges and resources. Thank you. Excellent. So I won't click on it because I'll kill it again. But, uh, but, but anyway, you can go there, cccregistry.org, you can see that. And, uh, and like I said, it's a, it's a California-wide um, uh, site for those. What, what you'll find there oftentimes, some places are really good at posting everything there. So you'll see adjunct positions posted there. But for the most part, um, these are the longer-term positions, the temporary contracts or the, uh, the full-time tenure tech positions that you'll see posted there. And then inside higher ed and indeed.com you're familiar with and there's gobs of other sites. Uh, you're not going to find, in most cases anyway, you're not going to find um, adjunct positions posted on there again because of these adjunct pools, but longer term positions you are going to find there. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're about to graduate and you're just looking all over California, those might be good sites. And then the registry as well. And the registry also has other really good resources I would encourage you to check out, you know, in terms of application material. Uh, in terms of you know teaching philosophies, all those kinds of things. That's really their job is you know to have that registry for jobs and 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 help folks find those jobs. So anyway, so those are some places where you might find some of those jobs. And what's the timing for those? Because that can be quite different. So the adjunct pools I just talked about that a little bit. Those are year round. Those are ongoing, right? So folks are going to hire out of those whenever there's a need. And so right now we're at the end of the spring semester, um, and. Um, and then the, uh, you know, there's, there's a need that's identified for the fall semester or potentially for the next spring semester. So they might be hiring as far out as that. Or they might be hiring, you know, our, spring, our fall semester starts at the end of August. Uh, they might be hiring uh, all the way up until the middle of August when somebody drops out. Right? So that kind of stuff happens. And, and, uh, uh, and so that's why it's important if you're interested in this to be in this adjunct pool. Right? Because that's if you have a competitive application in there, that's how you're going to get a call and then be invited for an interview and, and go from there. Um, the tenure tech positions are on a similar kind of cycle that you're familiar with from other institutions by default to spring cycle. What that means is that you know, or postings will be made in the fall, usually at the end of fall. Um, and then uh, applications are due sometime between December to February, I would say, for most places, usually January for most of them. And then, you know, it's the regular application cycle with, uh, you know, typically two interviews uh, in the spring and then decisions get made in the end of the spring term. And this is true for tenure track positions as well as oftentimes for temporary contracts. Um, however, temporary contracts can also be what's known as off-cycle, meaning there could be, you know, a need that's identified at the end of the summer 
um, and it turns out to be a need for a temporary contract, for a year-long temporary contract, and then it'll sort of be off-cycle and hiring for the fall, so something like that's a little bit more last minute. So anyway, so that's sort of the general timing that you'll see for a lot of those, and again, not, uh, you know, not uh, too, uh, too tricky, uh, but you know, I did want to point out that these adjunct pools, that's a common question, those are open all the time. Oh, by the way, actually the other thing I wanted to mention, these adjunct pools usually get refreshed once a year. So depending on what the community college is that you're looking at, they'll have this posted on their job posting. It'll say, oh, you know, if you have applied prior to XYZ date, make sure you put another application in there because we've, you know, tossed your application out, right? Because it makes no sense for folks to call somebody who moved on three years ago, right? It's a waste of everybody's time. So, so anyway, so that's the kind of stuff that you'll see on there as well. So um, in terms of the material, uh, application material and the application processes, again, this is something that's probably pretty obvious, but a couple of things I want to point out on that. Um, it varies greatly, of course, with what type of application that you're putting in. But if you're applying for an adjunct or part-time part position, then typically what you'll have is you'll have an online application uh, at those job sites that I just showed you. Uh, that includes a cover letter, or a CV, or resume, transcripts, usually unofficial transcripts, and then a list of references. Um, another note on these online applications, so the, the, the cccregistry.org uh, allows you to link to different applications directly at different community colleges, but because different community college districts do different things or do things slightly differently, there's no such thing as having a single application at the CCC registry that would allow you to apply to all sorts of districts. Now uh, there are some that can be uh, used to apply to multiple districts, but it's not like it's California wide, okay? Um, however, um, similar to what I mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, different community colleges potentially being in the same district, like Ventura, Oxnard, Moore Park, they would have a common application, right? So, so that's something that you can take advantage of in some cases. And then again, of course, you know, looking at particular community colleges and just their websites will give you the answer, right? There's Ellen Hancock is another option that's up north for you, right? That's another sort of, uh, um, you know, close by type, uh, type place. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that what you need, what you don't need for a part-time or adjunct application is the other stuff that you're going to need for a full-time application. Well, duh, okay, right? Letters of recommendation, teaching philosophy, and I'll talk about this here in a second, the diversity equity statement. But so the reason why I'm mentioning this is you can get a part-time adjunct application in with really very little effort, right? These are things that you're going to have anyway. And even if you're just exploring things, right, even if you're not entirely sure that this is the career that you want to go into, right, you can put an application in, you can potentially be called for an interview and potentially get a job and then figure out from there whether or not this is something that you want to do. And if you do, great, right? And then you've got the teaching experience that I mentioned earlier. And if you don't, that's okay, right? It happens all the time that, you know, part-time adjunct instructors, you know, figure out for whatever reason that this isn't for them, and then you move on, right? Uh, and that works for both places, right? This is not a long-term commitment by the institution, and it doesn't have to be a long-term commitment by the, uh, by the employee either, right? It can be if it works out like that, but it doesn't have to be. And that being said, full-time tenure track positions, temporary contracts, I have them in there because they're the same type of material, but temporary contracts are kind of different. But full-time tenure track positions are a long-term commitment by the institution. So in other words, somebody is going to only hire you for a full-time tenure track position. They, they're going to hire you and they want you to be successful in that. Right? They're not going to hire you to try it out. Right? So, so that's why I'm saying if you're potentially interested in this, if you think you might want to explore this a little bit, the part-time adjunct positions are a really good way of doing that. And they're also a really good way of making the case later on when you get called for an interview for a full-time tenure track position that you have this figured out, that this is what you want to do. Right? Because again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a really, really tough sell that you have this figured out, that this is what you want to do for at least the next X couple of years if you've never taught at a community college. Right? And this is the same thing with any other position that you're applying for. Right? I'm not telling you anything new, but I just wanted to make that clear because these are sometimes questions that we get along those lines. 
So uh, just another point here on the diversity equity statements. So those are uh, those of you who have applied recently will have seen these. These are popping up all over the place. Um, so essentially what most places will do is they'll have sort of a diversity equity uh, related question that they'll ask you to answer that. Um, I would encourage you, we can talk more about that later if you have specific questions, but I would encourage you to um, to take that seriously. So I know you're taking teaching philosophies seriously because you've heard about them for a long time, but I would encourage you to not underestimate diversity equity statements. Um, these are, even though they're usually just one question, these are taken very, very seriously in terms of screening applicants. Um, so, you know, a, a very weak less than thoughtful diverse, there's no way to nail it, right? I mean, there's not just one answer to have a diversity equity answer, right? That makes no sense. But, but to have a, a, a not thoughtful answer to that is potentially what could kill your application, uh, what could make it not being, you not being called for an interview. And then of course the rest of this is kind of obvious, right? You get called for an interview, you nail that first interview, you get called for a second interview, you nail that and you get the job, right? Um, the part-time adjunct positions are slightly different. Uh, you usually get called for an interview by the department chair and then there's usually only one interview, usually no teaching demonstrations. The full-time positions, they'll involve teaching demonstrations, so your first interview will usually have one or two teaching demonstrations in them, and then the second, so you nail that as well, and the second interview, and you'll nail that as well, and then you got the job, right? And then you've got a bunch of choices from community colleges to work at. Anyway, so these were a couple of points here that I wanted to make. Like I said, uh, some of this is, you know, not rocket science. I know that you're familiar with a lot of this, but hopefully some of this information was a little bit useful. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, do let me know. Uh, my email is also on there and so is my uh, phone number. If at any time later, you know, tomorrow, uh, next week, uh, next month, next year, you have a question, shoot me an email. Um, hopefully I'll still be there. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, or give me a call and, um, and I'd be happy to uh, chat with you. I'll also be on the panel at lunch and I'll be, I'm not going back to SBCC between now and lunchtime, so I'll be roaming around somewhere here, maybe uh, uh, does the coffee stop still exist up there? Does that, does that still? This is a new one, okay. But anyway, I might be getting some coffee up there. So feel free to hunt me down, ask questions. But I think we have another couple of minutes or maybe one minute or two or so for questions. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about summer jobs? Oh yeah, so I didn't specifically uh, talk about summer jobs, but that's a good question. They fall into the same categories as these. So you'd have um, uh, opportunities as part-time adjunct uh, positions during the summer. Uh, and then it's rare, so you're not going to have a full-time tenure tech position that's just over the summer, of course, but it's rare to have a temporary contract that's just summer. Um, but uh, the part-time adjunct positions are summer positions as well. And, you know, it really depends on the discipline and the, and the community college. Sometimes there's more of a need in the summer and sometimes there's less so. It depends on staffing and on offerings. But it's the same kind of thing, adjunct pools, Department chairs are your best resources for specifically summer positions as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. Um, I have a question. About, I have a question about training. Does yeah. the community college provide adjunct or permanent faculty any kind of training services? That's a really good question. I didn't talk about that at all. So, so full-time faculty. So across the board, full-time uh, tenure track, and then also temporary contracts. Uh, every community college has, is going to have tons of training opportunities, tons of professional development opportunities. Um, for adjunct and part-time positions, that can vary a little bit. It's usually one of those things where adjuncts are always welcome at these, um, at these training or professional development opportunities. Um, but most places, because of the contracts, can't require them to go to those. And it's also oftentimes real difficult for a part-timer to be able to make it to those because they're, you know, during the day you may have, you know, you may be working in your lab here or things like that. So it's usually one of those things where it's, for, uh, for part-timers, it's available but not required and usually not taken advantage of as much as I think everybody would like. You know, there's a lot of part-timers that I think would like to take advantage of and just can't. But that's sort of the, uh, in a nutshell, in terms of training opportunities, yes. And that brings me back to my earlier point about, you know, these are long-term investments, right? The institutions are investing in the faculty member and they want them to be successful and part of that is training, right? Nobody has it all figured out, right? That's a bunch of nonsense, so, so yeah. Yes? Um, as a full-time professor, how many courses would you teach on average? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question too. So the, uh, 
The, um, the way community colleges measure teaching loads varies a little bit from institution to institution. At, at SBCC, they get measured in what's called teaching loads. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of a long conversation, but the short answer to your question is if you, um, uh, so actually let me back up here. So it varies with how many students are in your class and whether or not it's a lecture versus a lab, right? But so for instance, in the sciences, um, you would typically be looking at probably two to three lecture classes and a couple of corresponding labs as a full load, okay? Um, now that can vary quite a bit because if you've got a large lecture class, large for community colleges is about 150 students, then that may be the only lecture that you have and then corresponding labs. So then you might have, you know, probably about four other labs to have a full load. Um, and if you've got a smaller class, you might have two or three of those and then corresponding labs. Okay, so that gives you a rough idea, but, but, uh, but yeah. Are we good? I'm being cut off, so. <laughs> All right, thank you.